everybody, it's Brock, and we got a brand new episode of All About. If you're new to the channel, I'm Brock, and I worked in a fish store for many years, and I've been in the hobby researching fish, corals, and inverts for over 10 years now. Today, we're going to be diving deep into one of the most popular symbiotic relationships between a clownfish and an anemone. Symbiosis describes any relationship or interaction between two dissimilar organisms. As most will know, the clownfish and anemone benefit each other. The anemone provides a home for the clownfish and protection by using the stinging cells from the tentacles, while the clownfish will provide nutrients in forms of waste and spot feeding the anemone with additional food the clownfish can grab. A territorial clownfish can also deter predators from eating the anemone. We're going to be going over a lot of things in this video from why and how a clownfish are able to even host the anemones, to tricks you can use in your own saltwater tank to get your clownfish to host the anemone. Clownfish are one of the few species that can survive an anemone sting because of a protective layer of mucus that covers their body. This layer appears to be three to four times thicker than any other fish that don't inhabit anemones. This makes them virtually immune to the sting. By not being recognized by the anemone because of the mucus, the clownfish can live amongst it and avoid the stinging nematosis. Clownfish also avoid triggering an attack from the anemone because they're not trying to eat the tentacles. Other predators like butterfly fish and angel will go after the anemone and try to eat those tentacles because they're so high in nutrients. Clownfish can also deceive prey from the anemone with their bright orange, red, and yellow colorations. Some predators will go after the clown, which in turn the anemone is going to eat. Almost as if the clownfish is baiting them to the anemone. This mutualistic relationship allows both organisms to benefit. The anemone tentacles are geared with nematosis, which they use to sting prey, causing the animal to become paralyzed. They will then use the tentacles to pull the prey to its mouth that sits right in the middle of the anemone's body. You will still have some predators that just outmatch an anemone, even if it's hosted by a clownfish. Sea turtles love to eat anemones. There are even snails and starfish that will go after them. A fish not often kept in the tank setting, but seen in the wild are mosshead sculpins. They actually eat the tentacles as a primary source of their diet. Clownfish are also going to have predators that will outmatch them. Triggers, eels, snappers, groupers, lionfish even, will go after a clown. So do clownfish host a specific type of anemone? In the wild, you can commonly see clownfish hosting magnificent anemones, giant carpet anemones, bulbs, and Merton's carpet anemones. Keep in mind, clownfish do not require a host anemone to survive and thrive. However, it is an amazing sight to see and a relationship that occurs often. Can multiple clownfish host an anemone? Multiple clownfish can definitely host a single anemone. The grouping would usually consist of a mated pair and their younglings. It is not likely that clownfish of the different species will host it together though. You would not see an oscillaris clown share an anemone with a tomato clown this would lead to aggression over that territory. Clownfish are predatorous hermaphrodites, meaning they're both male and can change their sex later in life. So in a group of clownfish, only the two largest fish are actually sexually mature and are usually a male and female breeding pair, with the female always being the largest. When that female dies, the largest male will change sex to a female and become the new breeding partner with the next largest fish in the group. This process is known as sequential hermaphroditism. When a clownfish has an anemone to host, you will usually see the female lay their eggs very near the anemone for protection of those eggs. So when you're looking at an anemone field with clownfish swimming around, take a look at their sizes compared to each other. I bet you can now pick out the dominant male and female, and then the other males that are around them. So can clownfish host multiple anemones? Clownfish can host multiple anemones at a time, especially in the tank setting when there's a lot of them grouped up in a small area. When my display was filled with many rose bulb anemones, my gold striped maroon clown would bounce from one to the other throughout the day, but you could tell there was still one that was his favorite that he would go to every night. In the tank setting, the big question comes up about how to get your clownfish to host your anemone. And if you ask me if there is a for sure trick that works every time, I would have to tell you no. But there are a lot of ways to help encourage the clownfish to host an anemone. Nine times out of 10, the clownfish you're seeing in a saltwater aquarium are aquacultured. They were one of the first successful aquaculture fish in the hobby. Clark eyes, perculas, maroons, oscillaris, and tomatoes are all aquacultured now. 
what this gives the reefer is, of course, sustainability in our oceans. And it also means the clownfish is going to be a very hardy fish and one that's accustomed to the tank setting. They're quick to eat from you. They handle water parameters well, and their health in the aquarium is just overall better. Now, what can be the downside? It has been noticed that at times the clownfish have no care to want to host an anemone. It's almost as if the past 40 years of aquaculturing the clown that it no longer has that instinct to go into the anemone. However, this is a myth, but it does come up often. So how can you encourage that symbiotic relationship between an anemone and an aquacultured clownfish? Now, what about the anemones? So rose bulbs, for the most part, are aquacultured. They are very easy to raise in the tank setting. They will eventually grow two mouths and split, creating two anemones. And you can picture this in your own aquarium multiple times throughout the year. For some of the others, like magnificence and carpet anemones, those still seem to come from the wild, but you can still find good luck using any of them. Before we jump into the tricks of getting a clownfish to host, I'll also say that clownfish can host many other types of corals. Euphilias, including hammers and frog spawn, are a great host. Xenia, Anthelia, even open brain corals we've seen clownfish host. And also at times whenever clownfish are in a tank with no coral, you'll still notice that they like a certain area of the tank or they found a certain rock that they stick to all the time they pretty much have hosted that area of the tank just like they would host an anemone. So sometimes it can be hard to get them to move away from that spot they've already hosted into a new anemone that you put into the tank. The first and most important thing is to pick a clownfish and an anemone that would naturally pair together as if they were in the wild. The best anemone I've seen clownfish host with the highest success rate has been the bulb anemones. Rose bulbs, green bulbs, there has been a ton of crossbreeds that have come out as well, some burst black widows, but all in all, the bold breed of anemone is the best. I see a lot of people buy the Haitian anemones and the condylactis anemones because they do look great and they're usually cheap, but it is a very rare scenario that a clownfish is going to host that type of anemone. In my experience, the only clownfish I saw even try was a tomato clownfish. Others, like we mentioned earlier, are those larger carpet anemones and magnificent anemones. Those have a good chance of your clown hosting them too. The next trick is placing the clownfish close to the anemone upon acclimating them to the tank. In most cases, we would dunk the bag underwater and have them swim out right above the anemones. But the clownfish that is stressed from shipment and acclimation, it would trigger them to go into the anemone for safety. You can also see this trick from some very popular YouTube videos where they'll use their siphon tube to place the clownfish inside and lead them directly on top of your anemones. Something similar is also using one of those acclimation boxes that sits on the inside of your aquarium and having the anemone and the clownfish in the box together for a certain amount of time in this close confinement helps the clownfish host what is near. A lot of times the clownfish will become territorial over an area of the tank. You can see them guarding caves or chasing fish away as they get close to that side of the tank. Even at times, the clownfish will charge you when you're in the tank around his area and he will pinch the fire out of you. If that is the case and you can easily move your anemone, move them to that spot that the clownfish likes. Same goes for new anemones that you buy. Shut off your power heads and any other current and place that anemone in the clown's favorite spot for it to grab a hold of with its foot before turning the flow back on and that'll give you a good shot at the clownfish hopping in that anemone around his favorite spot of the tank. The next trick is kind of combining the two previous ones and it's luring the clownfish to the anemone. A lot of times you can do this with a net or a skewer, typically something long that you can dunk into the tank and direct the clownfish to the anemone. This idea is that you're making the clownfish look for safety, which hopefully they find it in the anemone. This is not something I do often just because it can cause too much stress to your clownfish. This would definitely be more of a last resort for me. Now there are two other tricks that are very popular but a bit silly. To be honest, this is a trick that I would want Mythbusters to try and test out to see how well it actually works. I personally don't believe it makes a difference but a lot of people out there will say attaching a mirror to the tank to reflect the clown and the anemone will get them to host 
or attaching a photo of a clownfish and an anemone on the outside of the aquarium will also result in a successful hosting. What you're basically trying to do is you're simulating another clownfish in its territory, causing yours to go into its anemone for protection. Again, seems silly, but a lot of people out there say clownfish hosted the anemones afterwards. The last thing I can think of is adding more fish and rearranging the live rock. This again is something that would make the clownfish feel uncomfortable and feel unsafe and just tries to encourage them to find safety in that anemone. While there's all these new fish in, the environment looks different. It's one of those things when I try to tell people, it's just be patient with the clownfish. Let nature do its thing. If the clownfish wants to host that anemone, I can promise you he will. So let's say your clownfish is now hosting your anemone. What is there to do next? The main goal is to keep your anemone and your clownfish as healthy as possible. For the clownfish, they are carnivores, so they're going to want a meaty diet that consists of mysis, brine, krill, any of those frozen cubes you can thaw out and feed to them, they will love it. Clownfish are also big fans of flakes and pellets. Give them a variety of stuff to choose from. The anemones are photosynthetic, which means they will feed off the light through photosynthesis, but it's also good to feed them a meaty diet. You can thaw pieces of shrimp out to feed them. Just make sure it's no larger than their mouth, otherwise the anemone will spit out whatever it does not eat and you'll have leftover food floating around. You can also catch clownfish running its face into the anemone after feeding because it's trying to get any extra food the clownfish did not eat to the anemone. For the amount of times you feed your anemone will depend on the anemone itself. I like to feed mine once a week and they aren't spitting anything out, so usually you can tell you're feeding too often if he's not digesting at all. So a good light, meaty food will keep the anemone very, very happy for you. A clownfish's lifespan is also surprisingly long. Most live in 10 years or more in captivity. My gold striped maroon clown is eight years old this year, which just blows my mind. I think one of the oldest recorded was 30 years old. For the anemones, the lifespan is even longer. With proper care, it seems they can live forever. Some recordings have a green sea anemone at 80 years old in captivity and over 100 in the wild. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. The symbiotic relationship between the clownfish and its anemone is a sight that never gets old. You could watch the clown dance an anemone for hours and not even know it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of All About. Can't wait to see you at the next one. Stay safe, be kind, and I'll see y'all later.